All right, we won't necessarily talk about rotation on page 40 because you're not putting this on uh, retrofitting equipment and stuff like that. Uh, so there's no need for us to know that. The main thing you need to remember when you're replacing the pump is do one of two things. If you're gonna go ahead and take the pump off, take a picture of it. Before you take it off, take a picture of it so you'll know what port goes where and stuff like that. If, uh, if you don't have to take the pump off before the new one comes in, wait for the new one to come in. When your new pump comes in, number one, make sure it's the right one before you uh, disassemble that truck. Number two is look at the porting and stuff on it because you can mix up the porting. The pressure port and the suction port are the same size. The pump that we use is a very versatile pump. It's bi-rotational, meaning I can turn it clockwise or counterclockwise, either one. And it's side and rear ports. That's just, it, it, that one part number takes the place of four pumps. So you got left hand and right hand rotation and you got side and rear ports. So you got one part number for a pump that takes, takes the place of four part numbers. Why have the inventory if you don't have to? <clears throat> so uh, the, the key to it is take a picture of it before you take the old one off if you don't have the new pump or if you can wait for the new pump to come in and make sure everything's right and to, uh, uh, to look at it and make sure the ports go, uh, the fittings go in the right port. Page 41 is the unloader valve and contrary to popular belief, uh, some people think that you may set the main pressure for the hydraulic system at the manifold, but you don't. You actually set it up underneath the cab on these older trucks at this unloader valve. That's what that little relief valve is off on the corner over there that you see in the lower right hand corner of it. That's a little acre nut. And that's where we set the main system pressure. If I made a note here, and I probably would, um, is right here where this little, this little uh, cartridge is sticking out the corner, I would probably make a note that that is the main system relief and it's set at 1800 to 2100 PSI main system relief or primary relief, you can call it that too, main relief or primary relief, and it's set at 18 to 2100 PSI. Now, that being said, um, well, let me go ahead and talk about this because once in a while you might need to change an unloader valve. We actually don't use this valve anymore. With the new system, we don't need it anymore. Remember we talked about earlier this morning with the operators, we had four critical lines on the hydraulic system. When we got rid of this valve, we reduced it down to two. So the only two critical valves that are on, uh, hoses, only two critical hoses that are on a hydraulic system now are the suction line and the pressure line, both going to and from the pump. So that's the only two critical lines we have now. Uh, the four that we used to have went through this as well and they're non-existent anymore. But um, here's a little, uh, um, idiosyncrasy thing that we used to have once in a while. We would build a brand new truck, send it out, everything's fine for let's say the first six months and it always happened within the first six months. There is a spring in here that operates this relief valve and after you send enough of hydraulic oil through it back and forth, back and forth and, and work this spring, the spring will take a set. You know how it is with, uh, with springs on a truck or something like that, they take a set, they kind of break in or wear in so to speak and it rides a little bit better. Uh, that's what happens here, is on a brand new valve, this thing is factory set and the spring is tight. But after it gets used for a few months or whatever, all of a sudden the spring just takes a set, pressure drops in the system. I can't dump a load with my dump bed now. That's the most common thing they run into. My truck won't dump a load now like it used to. It happened all of a sudden. Well, the spring took a set and, uh, and collapsed a little bit. Not anything to worry about. It just took a set is what it did. And the pressure dropped. So once you crawl up under the truck and reset this thing and get it back up to 18 to 2100 again, you usually don't ever have to mess with it again. You might have to adjust it. And, and um, uh, back when we were doing these trucks and unloader valves, I would say maybe 5%, 5 to 10% at most uh, would ever do this. And it would always do it within the first six months. So if you ever change one of these unloader valves, and it's on there for six months or less and the pressure drops on it, that's what it is. Just go back and reset the pressure on it. Problem goes away, you won't ever have to mess with it again. Because no one's ever had to reset it a second and a third or a third and a fourth time. Uh, it's never been reset that many times. Because once the spring takes a set, that's it, you reset it and you're done. Just something you needed to know about. Okay, page 42. Um, Page 42 is the drive lines for a crankshaft driven pump. 
And uh, the one note that I would make on here is that the driveline parts all except for this one right here in the lower right hand corner of the page. This one is the only one that does not because it is special. But all these other ones, you see a part number there? Those are Spicer part numbers. So you can go down to your local uh, truck parts house if they carry Spicer driveline parts. Those are Spicer part numbers. So uh, the only one that's not is that yoke shaft. It's a weldable yoke shaft in the lower right hand corner of your page. And the reason for that is sometimes we get trucks with the engine set back and stuff like that and we had to have a longer drive line and so we had to cut one and weld one together. But the good part about that is if you ever have to do it in the field, uh, they're machined to a, a tight enough a tolerance that when you get one in uh, and you cut it to length, you just stick it together and, uh, and run a set screw in it and jam it uh, together, tack weld it in four spots, and then you weld right around it and you're good to go. I mean, it's just that simple. Uh, it is that simple. Doesn't necessarily have to be balanced and all unless you're a really, really bad welder. Um, but something that small in diameter is usually not that much of a problem. Um, but uh, that's the only exception to that rule. All right. Um, any questions about anything we've covered so far? One of the things I wanted to pass along and it happened a little bit this morning, anytime you guys have any comments, questions, or anything like that, bring it up while we're talking about it. Bring it up. Uh, it may be something that I had not originally uh, planned to talk about. And while we're on the subject, let's go ahead and get it in the open or whatever, and, and, and let's, uh, let's get it done. Uh, so this is, this is interaction here. I'm here to learn from you as well. Uh, so um, uh, that being said, um, we'll go on to the harness, uh, and I'll bring that over here. Okay, this is what we call a shutdown harness. Our guys in the shop, everything gets a nickname. <clears throat> If you called up and you said, I need a shutdown harness, you don't need a part number, you don't need nothing. Uh, there's going to be 20 or 30 people in our shop that knows exactly what you're talking about. The interesting part here is this harness, this shutdown harness, has been the same since 1992. It's not changed. The wire's not changed length, the color's not changed, the plugs have not changed. Nothing has changed on this since 1992. So it doesn't matter how old or how new your truck is, it's all the same. This part goes inside the cab and gets terminated to the controls wherever it goes. And the part that goes outside the cab has all of our sensors on it. So if you've got a sensor that's bad or whatever on your truck and you're trying to troubleshoot something or you're trying to make some repairs, always remember it's close to the hydraulic tank. All of our sensors and switches and stuff like that that are outside the cab are always close to the hydraulic tank. And here's what we've got. The first one here is going to be a body up switch. And this body up switch is a contact switch. And by the way, this is something that we're going to change. And let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Excuse me. We're going to change it over to a proximity switch. So uh, with, over time, this is not going to happen overnight, but we're going to get away from this contact switch because over time, some water will get in here or something like that and it'll corrode, it'll break off. Uh, you know, it is a mechanical switch. So in the near future, we're going to transition over and use, a, uh, use one of these proximity switches. And so it'll be a non-contact and these are very, very dependable. Um, this one is all stainless steel. Uh, it has a sealed connector, the connector on the back side. And I'm going to pass this around so you guys can see it. But if you look here next to the base of it where the threads are not at, you'll see uh, that you can kind of see through it. Uh, that's actually an LED light on the inside. So when you crank the truck up, you'll know whether or not this sensor is active and whether or not it's working and doing its job by this thing being lit up in here. You know you have power at the switch. So you may have some equipment that already has this on it, like a self-leveling feature for a, a front-end loader or something like that. Uh, a lot of the same stuff. But that's eventually going to make a change, and it will interchange. If you've got this style, and when we do make a change and you want to change over to that style, you can do that. That's another thing that we try to do to help you guys as well is um, we realize that in business you have to make uh, changes, improvements, and things like that. But if there's any way possible that we can leave the wiring alone or leave, the, uh, leave it as a normally open circuit instead of changing around and making a normally closed circuit or something like that, 
we try to do it if all possible. You know, I have some control over that part of it because I came from the shop too. I know how much of a pain in the butt it is to get a new switch in or something like that and the darn thing don't work or it's backwards from the way it's supposed to be and that sort of stuff. So when we do make changes, we try our best to make changes in a positive manner that they'll go backwards in your fleet if at all possible. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you're right on that. We are going to have to uh, uh, replace the, the harness on it. And that's something I forgot about. Keith told me about that and I forgot about it. But what we will do is, uh, in this case, we will have you just an overlay harness, just a simple four pin overlay harness uh, that you can bundle with this one. And we could probably use two wires out of here and just have two more wires and a little simple overlay harness uh, to go with that proximity sensor. So that's probably what we'll do on that one. And you're right, I forgot about that. Keith, Keith mentioned that to me and I had forgotten it. Um, so that's our body, body up switch. The, uh, the other one that we're gonna have here going to the filter, the hydraulic filter, and I haven't pulled that out yet. Talk about that in a few minutes. Is, uh, you remember we talked about with the operators that it's normal early in the morning with cold hydraulic oil that the light would light up, let them know clogged filter. This is the switch. It's nothing more than a contact switch. It's not actually a transducer, you know, or something like that. This is just ba a basic, simple contact switch. Um, the bypass in the filter is set at 25 PSI. The contacts on this are set at 23 PSI. So there's a two pound differential there between uh, lighting the light up and going into bypass. But once that hydraulic oil warms up, this uh, opens contacts, light goes out, everything's fine. So just a very simple little pressure switch for the, uh, the filter base that goes into there. The other two that we have, which are these right here, these actually do something. These will shut the hydraulic system down. So we got a temperature bulb here that screws into the tank. Uh, really no external moving parts at all. Uh, pretty well solid state. Uh, this one does have a moving part. It has a float on the inside. And um, one thing I want to point out here, if you'll look, page 43, over on the left hand side of the page, exactly halfway, you'll see a little label here. It says arrow points up. Arrow points up. You've got to install this switch correctly. Now, the interesting part here is when you're installing this switch, you can't tell what's correct and what's incorrect because you're on the outside of the tank and I can't see the inside. So what they did when they manufactured this switch, and I'm going to pass it around so you guys can see it, is that um, they put uh, an arrow on the wrench flats. That's what we mean, arrow points up. So I'm going to pass around so you can look at it, but this is the way it works. When you've got it properly installed and you fill the tank up with oil, this float rises up. So if you can remember that, you're home free. If you can't remember that, just remember here in the book, arrow points up because there are arrows actually molded into the wrench flats here, one on each side. And the arrow needs to uh, point up uh, for it to be positioned in there correctly like it needs to be. So I'll pass that in around so you guys can look at. Okay. Um, next one is hydraulic tank. On our hydraulic tank, um, a typical hydraulic tank for us, we make them in steel, we make them in stainless steel. Um, they, uh, they come in a 30 gallon and also a 40 gallon. And as a rule of thumb, if, if someone did not request it otherwise, a 30 gallon would typically be what we put on a single axle truck. And a 40 gallon is what we would put on a tandem truck with a telescopic hoist. Now, if you've got an underbody hoist like VDOT used to use, we could get by just fine with a 30 gallon tank, no problem at all. Uh, the reason we use a 40 gallon tank because we need that little bit of extra oil for that big telescopic cylinder that comes up in stages. You know, VDOT's gone to that now, so you've got to have a, a larger tank. But if you've got an underbody hoist uh, up underneath those, you can typically get by uh, with a, uh, with a uh, 30 gallon tank. Now, it, there, that's not sealed in stone. Once you pass a certain size telescopic cylinder, you automatically go to a 40 gallon tank. But if it's under a certain size, you can stay with a 30. 
So don't worry about any of that kind of stuff. It's just a spec thing. But the, our tanks are either 30 gallon or 40 gallon. We do make them in steel and stainless steel. I can tell you with the Envision system, that touch screen system there, the, uh, the standard tank that comes with that is stainless steel. That's the standard tank, is a stainless steel tank with it. Um, on the touch screen system, unless you ask for stainless as an option, the standard with it would be a steel tank. Um, but um, on the hydraulic tank itself, um, we, uh, on the inside, this is another thing. If, if I happen to gig you guys on anything, this would probably be it right here, is the in-tank strainer. Um, you see we show one in the picture there on page 44. But this in-tank strainer, about this time of year, in the fall of the year, this thing needs servicing once a year. That's all I'm asking. Just once a year, this thing needs servicing. We put an in-tank strainer in there in case any contamination gets into the tank. We want to make sure it don't get to the pump. We want to make sure it don't get to the valves. We want to make sure it don't get to the cylinders. We want to make sure it don't get to the spinner and conveyor motors and all that kind of stuff. This is actually straining the oil out before it gets to any of that stuff. The tank top mounted filter, which I'll pull out in just a minute, only filters return oil. That's all it does. It just filters the oil before it goes back into the tank. But if it stops up and goes into bypass, now we're pumping dirty oil, so now we're relying on this to do a better job. So uh, from my standpoint, I'm asking you to service this once a year, and about this time of year is when I would do it. And the easiest way to check on this, uh, to inspect it, because you don't necessarily have to remove it, just do a visual inspection if you can. What I would do is I would take the filter assembly out of it and shine a flashlight down in the tank. If you can see down through your oil, you can usually see this down inside, down in the bottom. It's turned sideways like this, up against the back wall next to the chassis. Uh, so you can usually shine a flashlight down in there. If you see a bunch of stuff stuck to it, gunk, mess like that, might be Teflon tape, could be chips of paint. I mean, there's a lot of different things it could be. Uh, could be dirt and grit too from the quick disconnects where we didn't clean them off. Um, but take a visual inspection here. If, uh, if it does need servicing, uh, you can reach down in there with a pair of channel lock pliers and usually within about a half a round, then you can uh, turn it off by hand. When you do remove and install this, it needs to be a little bit tighter than hand tight because I promise you, hand tight, it will not stay. Here's what I've seen happen over the years. It's, it's not normal for this to happen, but once in a while it does, is if you've only put it back on there hand tight, and you don't give it another half of a round or so with a pair of channel locks or something, that thing will vibrate loose over time and then it starts bouncing around in the bottom of the tank in there. And then guess what happens? When it does that number, now we're starving the pump for oil. And within just a few seconds, we just trash the pump because that's what that's what'll happen. It'll get up against that suction port like that, pump's gone. Pump's gone. You almost can't stop it fast enough. Stop the engine fast enough. I've seen that happen before. It's very rare just something you need to know. Uh, so when you put this thing back on, hand tight, plus at least a half of a round uh, to snug it up good. Um, I wouldn't use any Teflon tape or anything like that on it. It's not necessary. Uh, but make sure you go hand tight and a little bit more. <clears throat> if we take this thing off, <clears throat> excuse me, and go to the parts washer and clean it off, make sure you use the nylon bristle brush that came with the parts washer. Don't use a wire brush to try to clean this thing up because this thing has a wire mesh on it. And if you use a wire brush, you're going to start opening up the pores of this mesh. And now we're letting too large a particle through here. So if we do have trash in the tank, then we start pumping trash. So use the nylon brush that came with the parts washer. And if you can't clean it up, toss it out and get you another one. Um, I'm thinking we're somewhere between 30 and $35 for this thing. Now this is not the actual, this is not the actual strainer. This is not the one you're going to see. This is just a salesman sample somebody sent me and I, as far as I'm concerned, it's a reject. I don't want it. Uh, and the reason I don't is because it don't have a bypass in the bottom of it. I like, I like strainers with a bypass. That if you don't service this thing, which everybody has a habit of doing, is not servicing it, and this thing stops up on the outside here, now we start to go in the bypass. The theory here in hydraulics is I'd rather have dirty oil than no oil at all. Because no oil at all, you know what's getting ready to happen. So I'd rather have dirty oil than no oil at all. So once a year, you need to service this, uh, uh, clean it up, put it back in, replace it, whatever you need to do. Uh, but this is a good time of year to do that. Every one of the tanks that we put on for you 
for snow removal hydraulics, I promise you we'll have one of these inside the tank and it'll have a bypass built in the bottom of it. And if you haven't serviced it since you've had the truck, it's probably going into bypass right now. So you're beginning to pump some dirty oil probably. And uh, so, uh, and you know how it is with hydraulics. Everybody always yells contamination, contamination. Well, these are things we can do to try to prevent that from happening. Um, that being said, um, let's go over to the filter. There's uh, two different filters that we use, depending on your hoist. And one of them, this goes on a tandem dump truck with a front mount telescopic hoist. Has anybody got in here got a tandem truck with a front mount telescopic hoist? You do have some? If we put hydraulics on your truck for snow removal, it should have this kind of filter on it. The reason being is, um, is because of numbers, is because of flow. Uh, this particular filter will, uh, is rated at, at 100 gallons a minute. And uh, when you raise a dump bed, it takes anywhere between 17 and 21 gallons of oil to fill up that telescopic cylinder because we're pumping it out of the tank and pumping it in that cylinder for it to raise the bed. Well, when we hit the down button and the bed comes down and it comes down at a pretty good swift rate, if it comes down within 15, 20 seconds, we're evacuating oil out of that cylinder at a rate of 60 gallons a minute plus pump flow, whatever the engine's pumping out at the time too. That could be 30 gallons a minute. So now we need 90 gallons a minute flow capacity through a filter. We've got a 100 gallon minute uh, flow capacity on this filter. So that's the reason why we need uh, what we call the large filter on, the, uh, on a tandem with a front mount telescopic, mainly because of that dump cylinder. Because if you put this one on it, you're gonna blow it apart. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna come apart on you. Um, but this typically goes on a single axle truck. It's fine, nothing wrong with it. Uh, this one's rated at 50 gallons a minute. Now, from the outside, you can't tell the difference. There is no difference from the outside. It's only on the inside that you can tell the difference. So you just can't walk by a truck and just assume you got a big one or a little one. You might need to check into it and just make sure you've got the right one on there. Now, when we get ready to make a filter change, what we'll do, we'll come to this cap here and screw the cap off, which is O-ring sealed. There's an O-ring up under the bottom of the cap. We'll pop the spring out. This spring is very important. This is your bypass spring. So when the filter starts stopping up, it starts collapsing the spring and the filter pops up out of the bottom of the base and starts to go into bypass. So this, this spring here and the correct spring is very important uh, that we uh, make sure we replace that. Uh, one question here, and this applies to everybody, not just Lynchburg. Um, when you need hydraulic oil in your tank, do you add the oil or is the operator able to add the oil as well? Technician, both? Okay, well let's cover both then. If, uh, if an operator comes to you and says, I need some hydraulic oil to go in my truck, uh, you know the first thing he's gonna do is grab him a bucket, doesn't matter what's in it, he's gonna put some hydraulic oil in it, he's gonna dump it in the tank. Well, if you'll just tell, instruct him, this is how you put it in there, you screw the top off, and you take the spring out and you just dump your oil in the top of it right here, it's not gonna take it fast because what are we doing? We're filtering the oil before it ever even gets into the tank. So from an operator's standpoint, when it comes time to add oil to the tank, don't tell him anything other than screw the lid off and pop the spring out and just dump the oil in there. But he, it's not gonna go in there real fast like he thinks it is because it's going to the filter in order to get in there. So we're trying to filter the oil for that dirty bucket he's got. Now, for you guys in the shop, most of you guys got hydraulic oil on a reel inside the shop, good clean oil coming out. So what do we do? Now we got a big old hole we can put hydraulic oil in there with. So, uh, you know, from a, a technician standpoint, this is your best friend right here. This is also what I would do to shine a flashlight down in there to inspect the suction strainer as well. It's just that simple. Screw the top off, pop the cartridge out, shine a flashlight down in there, check out your suction line or your suction filter and, and, uh, and see what it looks like. Now, that being said, when it comes time to make a filter change, uh, what I would do at this point is take this whole assembly out. There's an O-ring seal in here. I had to kind of work it back and forth. It's beginning to get dry, dragging it around for 13 years. But there is an O-ring seal inside this cartridge. And um, the, uh, the good thing about this using a cartridge type 
is you don't have to use a can crusher anymore. Back in, I don't know if you still do or not, you guys still use can crushers? All right, uh, we don't typically use a spin-on filter anymore for most applications. We use a cartridge and there's several reasons for it and I'll tell you the story behind it. Um, but uh, we use a cartridge because you can see the health of the hydraulic system right here when you make a filter change. Is there a bunch of uh, paint chips? Is there a bunch of dirt, grit? Uh, is there a lot of uh, Teflon tape? Maybe somebody changed disconnects and used Teflon tape, which we don't recommend. We recommend the, the stuff in the tube, the paste, Teflon paste in the tube is what we recommend. Uh, how, what is the health of the hydraulic system? This is how we check the health of the hydraulics at this point. So when you get ready to make a hydraulic filter change, pop this thing out, go let it drain. You can toss it in the garbage can because this is legal to toss in the garbage can unless they change the rules recently. Now, what I would do before I just arbitrarily stuck another filter in here, put it back together, I take this thing to the parts washer because probably down in here in the bottom of this sump, there might have been a particle or particles too large to stick to this cartridge here. And when you switch the truck off and the pump quits pumping, it just falls down to the bottom down in here in the sump. So I would go to the parts washer, rinse this thing out real good, and we're still checking the health of the hydraulics and seeing what's in here. That's the big stuff that's in here. Uh, once you get a new filter in place, just pop it in there, drop it in, put your spring on top, put your cap back on top. Now this works about half the time, so watch it make a liar out of me today. There we go. Now, here's something else you probably didn't know. Hand tight plus a quarter of a turn. That's all you need. Don't keep cranking down on this thing to close this gap up. When you do that, you're putting too much pressure on this O-ring that's up under the head and it's trying to push this head off is what it's trying to do. So when the oil warms up a fairly good amount and you got all that kind of pressure up against it, how many people have had this thing right here to blow off? Okay, a few of them, all right. Let me tell you a secret to that too. Now, one is put the cap on right. Hand tight plus a quarter of a turn. That's what we want. Hand tight plus a quarter. That's all you need. That's, uh, if you want to make a note of it, that'll be over on page 45 because it shows you the two filters there. So when replacing the cap, go hand tight plus a quarter. That's all you need. Don't worry about closing the gap. Now, if somebody just happens to tighten it down too much and that cap blows off, if it ever blows off one time, you need to replace the cap. Trust me, if that cap blows off, the threads may look fine, but I promise you they're not fine. And you can put that cap back on there again, and I promise you it's gonna blow off again. I'll even give you odds on it. Uh, if it ever blows off the first time, get you another cap and put, put it on there, and put it on properly, and probably the problem's gonna go away. So that's the key to putting one of these caps on, and I, I really, really try to stress this in the training class because a lot of people don't realize that. They keep cranking down on and I would too. If I didn't know any different, I'd keep cranking down on this thing until the gap's gone. But that's not the proper way of doing it. Hand tight plus a quarter. That's all you need. Because this is an O-ring seal. Um, it, the oil's not going anywhere. We may have a little gap here, but the O-ring has sealed the cap and it sealed the, the base. Sealed against both. So hand tight plus a quarter. That's all you need. Now, that being said, on these filters, uh, when you do make a filter change on the hydraulics, there is also an air filter on the side of these as well. And what we do is uh, we have an air filter. It may not look like a whole lot, but think about it. A hydraulic oil, a hydraulic tank breathes as well. And especially with a telescopic hoist, as that body's going up and you're pumping 21 gallons of oil out of that tank, you got 21 gallons of air going into it. So if it's dry, if it's dusty, if it's dirty outside, a normal tank would be sucking all that stuff back in there. How many of you have worked on a hydraulic system, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a motor or anything else, worked on any kind of a hydraulic system after a few years when you need to do some repairs and you look down in the bottom of the tank and you run your finger across there and there's old uh, real fine silt gooey stuff down in the bottom of the tank? That's that silt because as that tank breathes in there, it's breathing just like our lungs are, and it's pulling all that trash and stuff in it, and it gets in the oil, and then overnight, it weighs more than the oil does, and it just falls down to the bottom of the tank, and it creates that silt in the bottom of the tank. No different than a pond, sealed in a pond. So what we're doing is we're filtering the air um, that is in the uh, hydraulic tank too to help prevent some of that silting 
uh, that's going on in hydraulics to uh, help make this hydraulic system last longer. So uh, my recommendation is that whenever you make a hydraulic oil filter change, go ahead and make an air filter change too. It's just the safest thing to do. Uh, very simple and straightforward. All right. Uh, the other thing about the filter is that uh, it does have a does have a, a a reusable gasket here, a neoprene gasket that seals it off. Uh, so if you need to get into the tank, and, and typically when you need to service that strainer, I would remove this cover. This thing is like a 10 inch hole in the top of the tank. Easy to get in there uh, to service that strainer. And the way you do that, so you'll know, is we have four attaching bolts here and it has a, a groove in it and we, we clamp the top of the reservoir up underneath the top. The top is the hole in it to cut a certain size and this grips the outer edges of that flange and as you tighten up a bolt it clamps up underneath the, the uh, top of the lid or top of the sheet metal of the reservoir. So when you loosen up this bolt enough, this thing will spin around and now I can pop this uh, top off of it. So that's how uh, one of these work. And honestly, the way I do it is I go ahead and take my filter and all that off and I reach my hand in here so I can seal it. Because you don't know how many rounds it is before that thing will start spinning around. And I usually, with my hand up underneath, put a little bit of tension on it and start loosening it up. And then when it spins around, I know I got it. It's, uh, it's just a simpler way of doing it. But it is a uh, reusable uh, neoprene uh, gasket that goes with that to be able to service that uh, tank. You don't have to use silicone and all that kind of stuff like we used two years ago.